I do want to meet them. I do, um, I am upset that, you know, many of them are, are, though in theory, you know, if there's room in the class, some of them could be students at other institutions, but most of them are FIT students. I could be riding in an elevator with them, passing them in the hall, and I don't know who they are. And they're my students in my class this semester. So I find that frustrating, and I do wish that we could have, I don't know, maybe a reunion or a meeting at the beginning of the semester, you know, to, to, to actually make a face-to-face -face connection, and then maybe at the end, just to celebrate we've all completed this course, and for them to meet one another since they've been interacting online. Because you're online, and people are used to having online access 24-7, that the student-professor relationship is I should have access to you 24-7. And so being really clear about office hours, and of course they can contact me in emergency if they're in a clinical setting, but you know, if the email comes in at 2 a.m., I'm not going to answer the email at 3 a.m., so I think online also gives, and I've talked about professors that have moved from the brick and mortar into online, and that's the one thing, is that you could sort of work 24-7, and you have to, as a professor, be really rigorous about setting your schedule and then with the students as well. On the flip side, I don't expect to email a student at 2 o'clock in the morning and have her email me back. I took a course one time as an online student and then I realized how hard it is on the other end. Um, especially when there was a deadline and I had to fly to Texas and I knew I wasn't going to make the deadline. I had to email the teacher saying, I, I'm not going to, I have to fly to Texas right away. And in, uh, so, uh, yeah, it was not easy. Online learning is a lot of work, and sometimes it's more work than in a classroom. And I think if a student feels, I'm going to take a course online, it's really easy, you all get an A, et cetera, it can be a shock to them. So in my introductions and in all my materials, I let them know ahead of time how much work it is going to entail to be successful, because a successful learner if they have an idea of how much time to devote for that online learning, they are going to be much more happy with their results. An online component, even in a face-to-face -face class, um, is actually really critical for students today because in terms of you know, experiences I've had, prior to leaving IBM, and that was seven years ago, so you know it's not getting any less so today, I was doing whole business projects with people from Brazil, Bangalore, Bratislava, you know, and we'd have multiple conference calls across different countries and time zones, and we were doing things in a virtual world using virtual tools, and uh, depending on who was running the project, the tool might be different, so you'd need to adjust and you'd need to figure it out before the call. and. Um, that's the way the business world is working today. I mean, we live in a virtual world, and I think it's really critical for our students, especially business students, uh, to, to feel comfortable. Um, so certainly, I keep kind of trying to put more and more stuff and tools into my online course to allow my students to figure it out, to grow, to, to become a better virtual worker because industry assumes you know this and um, so I think it helps. I think it helps. And I do online stuff in my face-to-face -face courses because I create them in such a way that they're flipped where they have to do stuff on their own and then come to class prepared to kind of do a team thing. Um, but again, that helps them and in my humble opinion, the digital generation of today is not so digital. I, I, I just, I don't see the depth of the digital understanding that you need to know to navigate this virtual business world. I mean, if, if it doesn't work by doing this, you know, they're stuck. I would have thought that 90% of students today would be like familiar with most everything that you were going to, because maybe they would have taken a MOOC on their own or something, they would have explored something in high school. I'm surprised by the relatively large number of them that are, are kind of innocent to what's going on 
on the online world. I don't solve it. I let them experience it. I figure if you know that they will. I always assure them that you'll feel like you're you're you'll be amazed that the outcome is the same as a face-to-face -face class in the end, and you'll be amazed if you just give it some time and don't bail or withdraw immediately. That you'll learn after you play around a little bit pretty quickly. I mean, I I allow students about two weeks at the beginning of the semester where it's very low stakes where I don't have many assignments to, where it's more about them sharing who they are. And, and I I'm, I'm, think I'm slower to ramp up in my online class than I am in my on-campus classes. I think there is a tendency by students when they can't see you and they don't get to know you to misinterpret your communication. And um, I do walk them through the core rules of netiquette. And I do tell them how there's always somebody on the receiving end of you know, the communication, whether it's discussion boards or emails um, that they're undertaking. And that it helps to read it aloud often to someone else, you know, your husband, your child, if they're old enough to understand, um, in the room before you send it or before you post it so that they can really hear whether or not it might be construed as offensive. And so what I find with students often is that if I'm somewhat strict sounding in my commentary or my grading, you know, evaluation, grading or evaluation, they take it really personally and um, in a way I never meant it to be. So it requires a lot of forethought and planning and sensitivity um, with regards to how you convey your responses. Um, in the written format. And I think that's one of the really tricky, tricky aspects of online teaching because they can feel everything's an accusation, you know, because there isn't an emoji associated and there isn't me smiling or there isn't my physical warmth that they would have if they came to my office hours. So that's one of the most challenging aspects of teaching because they don't have that physicality, they misinterpret your text. I felt very sick in the beginning in, during the semester. And there was about a week when I absolutely couldn't do anything at all. I was completely bedridden during that time. And so I sent out an email at the start of this brief period of illness saying that I may not be in touch that much because I was going through this, that I would work with them to complete the assignments. And if an extension was needed, I would do that. And this uh, student initially started off by saying, and I was not checking my emails because I was out of it. Uh, so she started to, she first sent me a very angry uh, email with some very abusive language in it. And then she sent out the email with four letter words, all capitalized, to the class. And so I, when I recovered from my illness, I immediately contacted her and said, look, this was the situation. You know, let's connect, let's talk. And uh, she didn't, uh, you know, respond. She started to send more of these emails. Eventually, I had to contact the dean of students, because students were then writing back to me saying, I don't want this kind of email with this kind of language. I don't want to get this stuff. Whatever sh issues she has with you, that needs to be resolved. And I don't want to be getting these emails. Uh, so eventually, I had to contact the Dean of Student Affairs, who then had to call the student. And it was ironical, because the day that the Dean of the Student Affairs met with her and told her, look, you know, this goes against the code of conduct, she comes out of that meeting, and she sends out another one of those emails to the full class, the same four letter words and you know how I was just you know the B word and the whole gamut of it. So she had to be called in for a second time uh, and said that. But that can be very debilitating and it's very humiliating because this sort of an email with this kind of a language goes to the entire class and students who may not be performing that well they pile on as well. They think, oh yeah, okay, somebody else has opened the door for this, so let me also get on this bandwagon. I think it was a very difficult semester, and I was very, um, I felt very humiliated and very hurt by this whole process. So now I've included a code of conduct. <laughs> that was a lesson learned in my syllabus that, you know, even if you have an issue, 
uh, you have to grow up in the classroom because an employer would not put up with something like what she did. You don't have that reliance on your personality that you have in the face-to-face -face format. Um, it doesn't come across as easily and you have to think of other strategies to engage the student and keep them there with you um, and to keep them coming back to that classroom, that virtual classroom. And um, especially in an age of, you know, attention distraction, um, you know, I mean, I believe we, we're in an economy of attention and distraction all the time. You know, what do people put their attention towards What do or distracted away from? And online learning can easily just become another place where, you know, the, the students only do what they have to. They only put in the effort that's going to get them the grade they want. And to make them want to come back to this classroom over and over again over the course of a week requires a lot of forethought and planning. And um, it also requires, or what comes part and parcel with online teaching, which I got a lot of positive response to yesterday, was the negation of the ego in teaching. Um, I went through a bad um, health experience about four or five years ago, right before I started teaching online, and it, it kind of got rid of my ego in teaching. I don't know why, but I was just so crushed and devastated by the experience that I was a, a kind of like a baby bird, and a lot of the dynamism that I had had in the classroom disappeared because I was pretty shaken. And so it actually ended up strengthening my teaching because I was no longer just relying on this exuberant personality to come in and wow them. You know, I really was more in, interested in thinking, how am I affecting them for the long term? How, what kind of a difference am I making? You know, it was one of those come to God moments. And when I started teaching online, I realized that it was easier to have, have the ego there because the physical body isn't there. and um, you really are thinking about how the technology works to help the student. And it's not that there isn't any ego in technology, but it's not quite the same, you know. Um, and what I think ends up happening with online teaching that is intimidating to a lot of professors is they can't just fall back on the same patterns, those same kind of, well, I'm a dynamic person and I'm the font of knowledge and I know this and that. Online teaching is changing the way knowledge is disseminated and instead of it coming from up on top from the professor down it's being more it's more of an exchange economy right where students are coming with their knowledge about your discipline because they can access any sources on the web any resources they can go to the Oxford Boolean library they can go to the Harvard library online and access primary source documents that you yourself may never have read and they can really blow you out of the water with what they've learned um, about the topic. And if you're going to be proprietary or think, wait, I'm supposed to be the only person spouting wisdom here, um, or even content and facts, you're going to end up having your ego sorely crushed. <laughs> and so te um, teaching online really says to you, you know, you say to yourself, oh, wait, I have to be open to learning from them and then taking the knowledge they're sharing with the class in a discussion board and pointing it out to the rest of the class and saying, you know, for example, Karen came up with a great response to the question because she talked about, you know, the way in which artists do this or that. And could you expand more on that, Karen? And, you know, say, I don't really know what Karen's referring to because I've never read the article she's discussing, but I'm fascinated by it. So you have to, um, you know, really let that old school understanding that the, the professor runs the classroom go. And it becomes a group learning experience.